to the serpent. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Many theologians, most theologians, believe that's the first messianic prophecy. It's pointing forward to the day that Jesus would die on the cross. He's, he's the fruit of the woman. And in that death and resurrection would come the crushing of the head of the serpent. Death would be defeated. Satan's power would be crushed. And it, it's such a powerful, powerful image. So much so that you remember years ago when The Passion of the Christ came out and Mel Gibson you know, uh, had his big story. I, I remember the first time Suzanne and I saw it. Uh, we traveled all the way up to Willow Creek Church in Chicago. Uh, they were previewing the movie for about 4,500 ministers around the nation. Um, I was going to be one of them. I was going to take my music minister. Suzanne found out Mel Gibson was going to be in the audience, or was going to be there. And the question came, uh, you're going to Chicago to see Mel Gibson, and you're not taking your wife. Yeah, I didn't listen um, up front. So then I quickly changed things and took Suzanne. And we sat in the nosebleed section. And then imagine the horror of Mel Gibson suddenly coming off the stage while Bill Hybels was interviewing him. And Jim Caviezel comes out on stage. But Mel Gibson goes and sits in the front row. And she tried to get me there early. And I didn't go. But in that movie, The Passion of the Christ, is a scene, and Satan in this dark robe unleashes the serpent, and it goes out across the ground, and Jesus in the movie suddenly stomps on the head of that serpent. And Gibson put it there just to illustrate this verse. It's powerful. How powerful is it? Well, it kind of came home to me this week. When I take and I look at this story, I don't see a God who suddenly uh, creates these playthings, these toys that kind of jump off of the workbench and go running away and doing their own thing. No, I see a God who's so madly in love with us, he calls us his children throughout Scripture. And then he goes to extreme lengths to try and save us. So much so, even here in the midst of us rebelling against him, he gives the first hint to his redemption plan. So I see a father and his beloved children who are in error. This morning I'm hurt. I'm depressed. I'm uh, hurt. I'm angry. Um, we came here four years ago with the idea, as many of you already know, that our children were supposed to come to Tennessee to. <clears throat> and um, and it, it wasn't happening, it hasn't happened. And, um, and so we've gone back and forth, and I've kind of shared that with you. But we did kind of dream that our granddaughter was going to come to Tennessee and go to school. I've even talked to a few of you about her doing a gap year and, um, and living here with us for about a year so she qualified for Tennessee benefits and be able to go to school at one of the Tennessee colleges. After all, this was the daughter, granddaughter that we had raised in our home. Uh, we had pretty much done most of her, uh, her rearing. Um, we're close to her. We're close to her and her brothers, but particularly to her. So I called her up the other night, and I'm talking to her about the gap year and enrolling in Tennessee and uh, possibly coming and living with us. And uh, she says, no, she wants to be with her family, and she wants to go to a school in Montana. Which kind of said a couple of things to me. Uh, one was, 
they're not leaving Montana anytime soon as they're planning on her being there in Montana schools while they live there. Um, but it was just disappointing, and I, and I really don't have any problem with her decision uh, from another point of view because, I mean, this is going to be the rest <coughs> of her life. She, we equip children to become adults, don't we? Um, but she must have heard the disappointment in my voice. Um, we got off the phone, said goodbye, love each other, that sort of thing. Uh, and I was hurting, I was disappointed, um, and just one more indicator that, that uh, we're just not going to see too much of our grandchildren. And uh, I didn't think too much about it until Suzanne informs me that um, my granddaughter thought I was crying, and I felt like it. So she ended up crying for a long time afterwards which hurt me even more. You know, I wasn't crying, I was upset. <clears throat> I didn't think it showed in my voice. But boy, I was disappointed. I was disappointed in, in just the whole progression of everything. And that, I think, is just a little snapshot, a tiny little dose of God's pain over our sin. See, we drive past the barn so often on this that we don't see the story of God in this. And he's so crazy in love with you that even in the midst of slapping you on the butt and sending you out of the garden, he gives a little tiny hint, but I'm going to buy you back. And all the while, his heart is breaking because his children are doing the very things. And, and think about the rebellion. No, God doesn't want you to eat that fruit because then you're going to be like him. Yeah, I want to be like God. I'm going to reject God and be my own God. That's crazy, isn't it? So we finish up here. Somebody want to make sure Gary gets in here? Don't think that this is a man and woman half naked in an idyllic garden and they eat a tree, eat an apple off of a tree, and it's just about that. No, this is a story of a God who loves like you cannot understand. He loves with something beyond our comprehension and we can't even love anywhere near as well as he loves. And he's been pursuing humanity for thousands upon thousands of years. And all the time we're listening to this knothead who whispers half-truths to us. And we go for the most gullible ideas, the most outlandish ideas out there. And we roll the dice all the time. All because we don't see a God who loves us. Father, as we enter into this time of communion, may this sacrifice become all the more real for us. When we talk about our rebellion, let us live up to it. But Father, may we see the beauty, the, the wonder, the, just the immense love that you have for us in sacrificing your son. Father, we grieve your hurt because of our actions. And we surrender our pride to you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 If you would please start passing out the communion, that would be great at this time.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, You, church, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a lampstand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, Jesus said, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father who is in heaven. If you would, when you receive your communion, prepare your wafer and prepare your juice. Near the turn of the century, before the universal use of electric power, the streets of many cities, towns, and villages throughout America were lighted at night by gas lamps. How many of you remember gas lamps? Okay, so I'm talking to another generation because I don't remember them either. However, the lamps, they say, were illuminated by a lamp lighter, a man that went around who strolled the streets at dusk, individually lighting each, each light. Several years ago, an elderly man described this procedure with a touch of nostalgia, and I think you'll really enjoy this. I watched the lamp lighter bring a lamp to a soft yellow glow, then move on to the next, and the next, and the next. And after a few minutes, he, he would disappear in the deepening twilight until he was no longer visible. But I would always know where he was and where he had been because of the avenue of light he left behind. Wouldn't that be a glorious eulogy for a departed Christian saint? We know where he has gone by the avenue of light. He has left behind the lives that were touched, the love that was shown, the love of Christ in our heart. As he said, we are the light and we are to be the light. As we make our way through the streets of our own life, do our loved ones, parents, grandparents, brothers, mothers and fathers, our friends, our associates at work, or at school? Do they know where we are going by the light that we leave behind us? Or maybe our light is growing a little dim, and our path is being beginning to twist and turn so that the light kind of loses its effect. Now is an excellent opportunity to set things straight with the Lord. The time, perhaps, to trim our lamps as we prepare for this time of communion. Jesus is the light of the world. He said, church, that's you and I. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father who is in heaven. 